Howdy folks, today we're going to be talking about an ancient Native American megacity that was built on the other side of what is now known as modern day St. Louis, Missouri. And to help us with learning about how big the scale of such an ancient city was, we're going to be reading a book from Timothy R. Paquitat, a professor at the University of Illinois. And this is his book called Cahokia, Ancient America's Great City on the Mississippi. The place that we now call Cahokia is ancient America's one true city north of Mexico. As large in its day as London and the political capital of the most unusual Indian nation. At the time, all the stars and planets in the northern hemisphere's night sky were visible above Cahokia, situated in a broad expanse of the Mississippi River bottomland, just east of what is now St. Louis, Missouri. Cahokia's people looked to the morning and evening stars for guidance, inspired by ideas from Mesoamerica, possibly brought back by Cahokian rulers, travels, priests, vision quests, incorporated them into a religion that would displace traditions across the American Midwest, South, and the Plains. Nowadays, we can barely see the, the stars at night from St. Louis because there's tall buildings that crowd the sky, street lights blot out the stars, even as the growth of the modern civilization erases the archaeological remains of the ancient North Americans. Cahokia sits silently awaiting the almost 300,000 visitors who come to see it each year. And so, at one time, there were more than 200 packed earth pyramids or mounds at Cahokia and its suburbs. And uh, five mounds were destroyed in the St. Louis area before the Civil War. To take a pause from the article, it did share the fate of many mound sites across the United States being destroyed for industrialism and probably pollution as well. Who knows? But the largest mound at uh, Cahokia was saved. The largest mound at Cahokia, Monk's Mound, is the third largest pyramid structure in all of the New World. And therefore, it deserves our attention, it deserves our respect, and it goes to show that Native Americans in the United States weren't a bunch of savages running around naked. They had civilizations, and societies and even an economy things that we have so we can't we we have to rewrite history and try to relearn about this ancient city try to figure out who were the rulers of this ancient city who were the commoners of the ancient city and figure out what types of multicultural groups of native americans were actually there which is extremely hard for us to do because there's really not much, there's not any written language at Cahokia that's left over. What we're going off of is uh, historical geographical context. We're going off of archeological finds. We are going off of some language, but language of the Mississippian people who lived around the Cahokian site, who did have trade connections with Cahokia, and that most definitely can be proved in the archeological record. So, we're going to have to start off here with talking about the types of Native American uh, ethnicities or ling linguist groups that would have resided at Cahokia. Okay, so to read again another excerpt from Timothy R. Paquitet. Today's archaeologists see the spread of Cahokia's influence in the shape of platform mounds and ancestral temples and the works of art buried in the dead across the Midwest of the United States and the South. And marine shell beads traded to distant lands among the pottery shards decorated with Cahokian insignia scattered on the floors of Indian homes from Wisconsin to Minnesota and also all the way to the north of Oklahoma and Louisiana in the south. So that's one excerpt that we're going to read right there. And um, to go through another excerpt, originally Chunky was the game, the favorite amusement of people, and evidence supporting its explosion of popularity points to Cahokia. In 1492, the time of the first European contact, Chunky was played across the south and the eastern plains from the Cadoian heartland east of Florida to the north in the stopping at North Carolina and finally looping northwest through southern Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and back up to the Missouri River. The widespread occurrence of and the similarity in its play suggests a common origin in the not too distant past, perhaps less than a thousand years. By the early 1800s, Lewis and Clark, Catlin and others had recorded how the game was played among the Osage, Pawnee, Omaha, Hidatsa, and Mandan. 
These non-natives made no mention of joining in the game, perhaps because of the total body workout involved, or perhaps owing to the skill level needed to master. There's fine chunky stones all throughout the south, and recorded the Choctaw and other Muskogee speaking tribes playing chunky, much like the, the people that lived around modern day St. Louis today, of the Mississippian sphere. The Iowa and the Oto tribes spoke a varieties of Suian languages that were termed to be Chiwir. That is information from Timothy R. Paquette, but I'm going to rip off of that and say that a lot of the Suian classified languages do have connections with Caddoian speaking people and they have connections with uh, language families that have not been properly classified yet due to the genocide of the Native Americans. We're going to be talking about the Muskokian languages that were a part of the cultural sphere of the Mississippian uh, Southeastern Ceremonial Complex. This is an article from Gary C. Daniels, and uh, Gary C. Daniels is a linguist, and uh, this is a very informative article. Uh, during the colonial period, tribes including the Hetichti, Chihuahua, the Okani, and the Sawokli, and the Masoki, based on the number of places De derived from the Hittite language, scholars believe this language was once spoken over a much larger area of Georgia and Florida than it was during colonial times. Curiously, the Hittite language appears to contain words of Mesoamerican origin. Mayan words appear in Hittite dictionaries. Chi is the Hittite word for mouth. Chi also means mouth in the Itza dialect of the Mayan language, which was heavily influenced by the Totonacs. One of the Itza's most famous cities was Chichen Itza. Chichen is translated to, quote, mouth of the well, with Chi meaning mouth and Chen meaning well. Chachani means well in the Hitichiti language. And so if you add the prefix um, Chi meaning mouth, uh, Chichani would mean mouth of the well in Hitichiti which is remarkably similar to uh, the Itza Maya. Chihuahua, sometimes also corrupted as Chia or Chihau, was a common town name among the Hitichiti Creek Indians, whose villages were located besides rivers and streams. The earliest record of this town by this name appears in the journals of DeSoto Expedition, who visited a town named Chihuahua that was located on an island in the middle of a river. Thus, Edgewater is an appropriate description of these villages. Interestingly, the area around Lake Okeechobee in south-central Florida was known as Chia, and the people who once lived there were called the Miami. One researcher theorized based on absolutely no evidence the word meant high place, but due to its use of the lack of the surrounding area, Lake Okeechobee it seems more likely a corrupted form of Chiawa or Chiha, meaning Edgewater. In Hitichiti, Okeechobee means big water, where Oki means water and Chobi means big. There was another word for big among Creek Indians, Lako. In Mayan, Laka means big as in the Mayan name for Palenque, Lakama, which means a big water. The Ha suffix was a way in which the Mayan language denoted water. Similarly, in Georgia and Florida, there are many rivers and lakes with Hittichiti names that end in Ha, such as the El Tamaha River in Georgia, the Oklawa River in Lake Hitichna in Florida. This suggests that they use the suffix to denote water, but only with further research can we be certain. The Mayan word for blood is Cheich. According to anthropologist and linguist John R. Swanton, the Natchez word for blood was Ichia, which, although different from the usual Creek Indian word, which is in Hitichiti, is Echi Ikachi. The Hitichiti dictionary lists Pichikichi for blood, yet it also lists the prefix Pichi as to give. Thus, it is likely Pichikichi. It means to give blood. And Swanson's Ikichi is the word for blood in Hitichi. So you may be wondering, why am I, you know, bringing this up? And it's because, of course, the Mississippian sphere of influence was definitely a, 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 probably a combination of the Muscogee-speaking people and the 
the Caddoian speaking people and the, the, the languages like the Ho-Chunk and uh, the Omaha and the Pawnee. These people were the, uh, the, the, they're the descendants of the players of the ancient city of Cahokia, the people that were involved in this type of transaction said if there was some sort of Mesoamerican influence, it could have possibly have came from the Hitichitis and the Muscogee and the the Chickasaw and Choctaw speaking people that migrated uh, north towards Tennessee, Kentucky, and bordering areas like Missouri, Arkansas, and things of that nature and such. In Central America, where Choc is a god worshipped by the Aztecs, Toltecs, Maya, And T is depicted as having a swirled nose. He is the god of rain. And you can see that there is a very clear connection to this plate found in uh, Florida and chalk. So if we look, this is actually the plate found at Etowah in uh, Georgia. And this plate, it has that same goofy nose, as you can see. But a lot of uh, archaeologists think that this is a depiction of red horn. Red Horn is a mythological character that was uh, uh, worshipped, maybe, or celebrated by the Winnebago, the Iowa, and many people, the Caddoian people as well. Here's a, a mask of the horned god. In the Popol Vuh, you have two twin heroes born of a virgin mother from the maize god. And then the, but the maze god goes to fight the, the lords of the, the underworld and play a, a games of ball with them and go through their trials. But the maze god dies in the underworld. And so it is the job of the, vir, or the virgin mother after having the, the twin heroes. The twin heroes have to go and save them. Well, in the, the Winnebago and Iowa story, Redhorn, the character depicted on the copper plate, he has two twin sons. And so... They are depicted in many different ways all throughout uh, the southeastern ceremonial complex. But we can see clear calls to Mesoamerica and connections through mythological means. What we have to do is try to piece together history based on what was happening in ancient pre-Columbian America. We don't really have very many sources for such a thing, but we do have one source, and that is the DeSoto Expedition. It took place in 1539. So DeSoto makes it to modern-day Tampa Bay, Florida. He goes up in the border of uh, Georgia, pretty much. So then he meets the Appalachian people, but he pretty much like raids their village and then their village is pretty much abandoned by the Appalachian. But during the middle of the night, the Appalachian came back to try to burn down their own village because they knew the damn Spanish were inside of it and they weren't going to rest unless they knew the Spanish were burning up in their deserted village. But it left them with no shelter during the winter time, so they were fucked. You know, and he's meeting all these tribes. He makes it to the border of uh, Georgia pretty much. And he ends up having a ground battle with the Napatuka, which were a, a Muscogee-speaking people. He goes up and he meets the Capechqui, and apparently goes up more. And uh, this is a place where DeSoto actually had found native people living on a mound. They were Muscogee-speaking people, which we can tell that historically through the name of their towns, Altamaha and Okote Kofeki, Kofechi, I think that's more how you'd pronounce it, in the Ichisi, which are all Muscogee words. And um, so what happens is they're living around and by this mound, much like the modern day people of Cahokia would be living around Mount. Which is a a very excellent point to show us that by the time Europeans came to what's now known as the United States, native people were still living in these pyramid temple mounds. And so you can actually visit the modern day site of where DeSoto had actually reached this mound. And what DeSoto ended up doing was is putting placing a giant cross on top of the largest mound to show the native people that Christianity was the way. In which none of them understood what the fuck was happening, of course. So then they kind of move over and they make it into uh, South Carolina. And then they go up and they make it a little bit into the edge of North Carolina. And then they go into Tennessee. 
And then they, they kind of stay in Tennessee for a little bit. And then they cut back down through Georgia. Then they go into Alabama. And pretty much runs the, the moment that they make it to Alabama, they're just having a constantly battle against the tribes. And the tribes are not digging them. They're still asking, where's the greatest prince of the land? And where can we find gold and stuff? Because they're not completely done with this trip yet. But in the town of Mabilia, and, and also in the town of Tallahassee, which is now known as modern-day Tallahassee, there were very, very epic, bloody battles. And so they keep going. They make it up to Mississippi, and they're having a battle their whole way through. They go up the Mississippi River for a little bit in a very strange little kind of passage where they reach the very tip of Missouri because they're in Arkansas. And so they, they reach the tip of the Missouri-Arkansas border down the Mississippi River from where Cahokia actually is. Not not too far. What I read was a three-hour car drive, which would translate. Maybe they can make it there in a couple of weeks by on feet, maybe. They kind of keep going down. They go through Louisiana. They find a, a tribe called the Tula, who is a Caddoian-influenced tribe, but they also seem to have Mesoamerican influence. They go down, and the Mesoamerican influence, of course, Tula, the Toltec Indians of Mexico, which was a giant empire. Uh, They go back down. Oh, and then on the Mississippi River in Louisiana, Hernando de Soto, the conquistador, dies. Hernando de Soto was a terrible guy. He is responsible for the overthrowing of the pretty much Empire, there, Inca. and also Central American natives. He slaughtered and used the slaves, and uh, so then at that point, he died. His men put him in the Mississippi River, and his men try to get back to the shore, but they're getting ambushed twenty four seven. So, Hernando de Soto, to relate this back, of course, to Cahokia. He was the first person to step foot in in, uh, Missouri. And uh, he barely stepped foot in Missouri, according to some of the maps. The next people to make it to Missouri were were French explorers, Father Jacques Marquette, in 1673. So it it took Europeans till 1673 to make it back to the territory, Missouri, where Hernando de Soto, the conquist, the Spanish conquistador, stepped foot in for make, maybe a couple of seconds. Hernando de Soto, though, he was entering an area that was still highly populated by people that were probably a part of the trade influence with Cahokia. I would say, based on evidence, the Caddoian speaking people that built mounds and the Muskokian speaking people that built mounds in Arkansas and Mississippi were definitely a part of, of the Mississippian trade network that scientists refer when they say that stupid word Mississippian. And so one one question that would be very good to beg is Maybe one reason we can't find the language of the people that lived at Cahokia is because there was some sort of catastrophe and the remaining amount of people that lived there, even they died. And this probably could be explained by disease. And so by the time Father Father Jacques Marquette made it back to Missouri in 1673, it had been 130 or 40 years since DeSoto had actually reached such an area of the world. And um, when DeSoto first reached the Mississippi River in the area of Arkansas and Louisiana, right uh, under right under where Cahokia was, just the Cahokia was just up the Mississippi River, um, there were at least, I think, 30 large uh, cities of, of settlements from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, all the way up to Tennessee. So when French, you know, when Father Jacques Marquette made it back up into the same area 130 years later, he reported that there was only four large settlements, which goes to show that there was a giant population loss. 
in, in these known areas, there was a huge population loss. Uh, we would have to actually uh, learn to see what was happening there. Um, and what was population loss? So when we talk about which tribes that are living today may have the closest relations with the people that inhabited and built the great city of Cahokia, um, my when I think about who what tribes today existed and interacted with the Cahokian sphere of influence, I know that the Caddoian people did because at Spiro Mountains in Oklahoma, a Caddoian mountain site. They found copper that presumably came from Cahokia. And um, another amazing thing that uh, was found at Cahokia was an ancient burn pit at the top of one of these mounds where they would have been burning copper and using this copper to morph it into their gods and whatnot. So we're going to be talking now about really the large distribution of copper artifacts found in the United States and the so first we got the is the Etowa and the Rogan plates now the Etowa these uh plates show that there was a definite connection between the Caddoian people and the people of Cahokia and the people of the Muskogee speaking mound builders these were the people that inhabited Etowa a long, long, long time ago. And so we're going to go from there to looking at the Illinois plates. The Illinois plates are very interesting because they uh, bear, they show a very similar resemblance to the the plates found in Georgia and the plates found in Florida and they're all the way in Illinois, and they show a very similar style of artwork with uh, the native uh, people dancing with ear spools, and uh, very interesting. This was found, of course, like I said, in the Upper Bluff Lake of uh, Illinois. It's a little bit below Cahokia and the Mississippi River, actually. And so now we're going to go to um, the Perora the Perora Falcon. And if you look at the Perora Falcon, you can see that it does bear resemblance to the 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 plates found in Arkansas and uh, the plates found as well. It's likely that the copper came from uh, the Copper Harbor in Lake, by Lake Superior. It is the largest copper reserve in the United States and for the ancient people, it would have most definitely have been their largest copper reserve so, and it was closest towards Missouri, so. If we look at the spiral plates and we compare the spiral plates, which was a Caddoian Mississippi culture in Oklahoma, with the plates that we were just looking at, you can see that they're very similar. Now we're going to look at the wolfing catch plate, early gnarly. And this was found in the Missouri Woodlands in Dunklin County, which is very close to Arkansas. Very close to where DeSoto would have stepped foot is actually where these plates were found. And uh, these are some of the most best preserved plates that we have found. Very beautiful. These seem to have come from Cahokia or the Cahokian sphere of influence. And uh, now we're going to check out a copper plate from Florida. And it is a copper solar ogi deity plate found at Lake Jackson Mountains in Florida. As you can see, this plate bears a lot of resemblance to um, other things that we have seen in uh, in the Mississippian culture. But this plate bears very similar resemblance to the Lake Bluff, Illinois plates. And this definitely shows that Cahokia had a wide sphere of influence. And specifically, all of these plates oftentimes depict birdmen and avian birdmen and these themes of uh, very, very far out stuff. Anyway, at the city of Cahokia, there is a burial in uh, not the largest mound, but I believe it was Mound 72. Inside of this mound, 
they have found more than 20,000 marine shell beans probably traded with the, the people that were living down the Mississippi River. It would seem evident to, to me that that would be the case. And um, they were arranged in a, in a shape resembling the head of a bird. And so they had turned this man, they gave him giant wings made out of these beads in his deathbed. And um, pretty much we see this bird, the avian image, and also there is an artifact that they did find at Cahokia. Besides the giant copper smelting pits that they found at Cahopia, they have not found very many amazing um, copper artifacts besides ear spools and things of such nature. But they did find a, a little rock plate that shows the exact same bird man found on the Mississippian copper plates at Etowah in Georgia. It is the exact same image. I mean, it'd really be hard for you to deny such a thing. So, like I said, we, we kind of have, we've, you know, the, the sphere of Cahokian influence was quite a large one that seemed to have uh, consisted of the Muscogee and the Kadoian and um, a few other orbiting uh, tribes, like the Winnebago and also the Osage. And it was the tribes that spoke the Chiwir language that believed in in red horn the the ho-chunk people they still tell stories of red horn and and um and so we can see very clearly i feel like with the archaeological evidence that we can see very clearly that it was the ancestors of the chiwir speaking people of the cadoian speaking people and the muskoki speaking people and maybe more that made up the large majority of the Mississippian, what's, what the scientists call the Mississippian influence. Now, I mean, through the Native American culture itself, like maybe the Native American culture spread across the colonial borders.